Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. Just a few points of logistics and then a brief bit of context before we begin our session today. Uh, given our short time frame, we're not planning on fielding any questions, uh, but do note that this session is going to be recorded so you can review the information on demand as well as share this with others throughout your organization. Just look for a link for me uh, to the recording within 24 hours after the session ends. Now, a bit of context. We're highlighting our presenter today, Ori Fumi, for two main reasons. One, he is co-author of a book, The Lean Strategy, that has really captured the attention of the lean community like few books have in recent years. And honestly, for good reason. It includes the thoughts and the work of uh, four authors, Michael Belay, Dan Jones, Jacques Chaise, and Ori. Ori also uh, recently authored an article for the Lean Post, which has gotten a tremendous response from the community. Um, I will send a link out to that article if you have not yet seen it, but we highly encourage you to read not only the article, but the comments, as there's a very interesting debate going on following the article. And please do contribute your own thoughts and, uh, and as well to the, uh, the comments. The second reason we brought Ori on here is uh, we are highlighting him because he is one of the impressive list of presenters at the annual Lean Accounting and Management Summit, which takes place in Savannah, Georgia, September 14th and 15th. This is, this is really the place to meet some of the top thought leaders and practitioners who are seeking to bridge that gap between uh, lean operations and traditional accounting principles and practices. So you can learn more about that event if you visit leanfrontiers.com. Right on the home page, there's a link to that particular event. So let me introduce our presenter today, Ori Fumi, who I've already mentioned by name. Ori was Vice President of Finance and Administration and a director at the Wire Mold Company, which gained international recognition when they were highlighted in the book Lean Thinking. Ori was Wire Mold's Chief Financial Officer from 1978 until his retirement in 2002. Ori has been inducted as a life member of the Shingo Prize Academy. He also serves on the Board of Directors of the Lean Enterprise Institute. Uh, serves in a position with the Lean Healthcare Organization called Catalysis and is a board member of a manufacturing company and private equity firm. So, Ori, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and just turn it over to you. Thank you, Duane. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to, uh, to uh, sign on to this webinar. Um, as Duane mentioned, uh, I uh, have recently uh, finished working with three other people on a book that was published in June called The Lean Strategy. Uh, I, I wrote a book back uh, in 2004 with Gene Cunningham called Real Numbers and very honestly never intended to write another book. But, uh, but when I was approached by Dan Jones and, uh, and Michael and uh, Jacques about joining them in this effort uh, and talking about lean as a strategy, I, I couldn't resist. Um, and it's been a fun project. The, um, the interesting uh, part about it, uh, Dwayne mentioned an article, and it has generated a fair amount of controversy. If you go through the comments, certainly uh, this one, and then there's a previous article. My article was in response to a previous article with Art Byrne. Uh, it, we've generated a a bit of controversy, uh, kind of like hitting a hornet's nest with a stick uh, by putting a stake on in the ground and take, taking the position that Bart and I have had since the very beginning that lean truly is a strategy. So I'd like to give you a, some highlights of, of the way we think about that. Certainly, you know, in a 40-minute in a webinar, I can't give you uh, all, the, all the content of the book, but um, but I can give you some of the highlights in terms of why we, we think this way. Um, for those of you that don't know Wiremold, um, it was a privately owned company. Uh, Art Byrne joined us in September of 1991. 
1990 was the last full year before we embarked on our lean journey, and we sold the company in 2000. And if you look at some of these key metrics on the screen, you will see a very dramatic, very dramatic difference in sales per employee, gross profit, uh, throughput time from weeks to days, product development time from years to months, et cetera, et cetera. Inventory turns uh, 3.4 to 18. And we had an enterprise value in 1990 of 30 million and ended up selling the company nine years later, 10 years later for $770 million. Uh, a very dramatic change. If I didn't tell you that this was wire mold 10 years apart, uh, you could rightfully assume that this was two different companies. Um, and kind of in a way it is. Uh, it's the old wire mold and the new wire mold, pre-lean, post-lean, if you will. Uh, and, and because we became a different company, we literally transformed ourselves into something else. Um, when Art came in September 1991, the first thing that he did was to basically teach us what lean is, and more importantly, what it is not. Lean is not a manufacturing tactic. It is not a cost reduction program. It is a complete, all-encompassing business strategy. And like any other strategy, whether you ch choose to follow a lean strategy or some other strategy, once you select that strategy, everything you do as a company needs to support that strategy. And so like, so, so like any strategy, generically, everything needs to support it. It's a total business strategy. Um, you know, when you research the subject of strategy, you see several different definitions. Uh, here are three of them that I found. Um, you know, one talks about it's a high-level plan to achieve, you know, some certain goals under conditions of uncertainty. Uh, shaping the future by deciding what you need to do today with the available means. And the one that I prefer when I'm talking in a business context is basically a system of formulating and implementing a plan to create competitive advantage. You know, every company that's in business is trying to compete for a group of customers that other companies are trying to compete with uh, them for. And so, so basically, in order to be successful, we want my company to have a competitive advantage in some way so that we'll attract more customers in the competition. Um, that, that's kind of the way we think about strategy. Um, and, and one of the premises in, that we have really is that if we continue to think about lean through the traditional way that we've thought about management and strategy over the past hundred years or so, uh, we're only going to get traditional results. If we have traditional thinking, we're going to continue to get traditional results, which very honestly have not been impressive. Um, so, so that's kind of a, a, a premise. Um, so, so when we talk about strategy in, strategy in this context, really it's different because we're talking about creating competitive advantage and implementing most people that think about strategy just think about the first half in terms of how, how do what do I want to do and 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 very honestly the strategic discussion doesn't spend a lot of time talking about implementation uh, we do talk about that in, in our book uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, over the next half hour or so um, let me give you a little example let's take two companies okay company a uh, and Company B are in the same industry, they use the same equipment, bought from the same vendors, and the only basic difference between the two is that Company A takes about one hour to do a changeover on those machines, and Company B has figured out how to do it in a minute. Um, so if you think about that, uh, intuitively, you know, you, you can say intuitively B is going to have lower cost because you know, they, their setup time is in one sixtieth of the time. And because if each company devotes one hour per day to setup, company A can make two products a day, and company B can make 60 products a day, each one with a one-minute setup in between. Okay, 
So because company B can do that, they've got greater flexibility in dealing with changing customer demand. And as we all know, the only thing you can say for sure about customer demand is that it always changes. Uh, and so the chances are company B is going to have better customer service because of that flexibility. Okay. Now let's say in this industry, the average lead time is four to six weeks. But because of this flexibility that company B has, uh, has created for itself, it goes into the marketplace and advertises a 48 hour lead time. Now, if you think about that, how might company A respond to that move in the marketplace? They might increase the amount of inventory they have, and that will increase their cost. They might say, I can't give it to you in 48 hours, but I'll give you an extra 5% off, which will reduce their profit. And if you think about the things that they can do, they're basically all going to cost money, cost profit. So basically, this, this thing called setup reduction, which we often think is an operational tactic, when applied to the market, has an enormous strategic implications. Uh, and the reality is, when we start creating internal gains, if we constantly think about how to turn that into a benefit for our customers, that becomes strategic. Okay? And so, so we can now think about all the things we do as we transform ourselves into a lean company in terms of how do we create strategic advantage? Okay? This is called basically a time-based strategy. Okay? It uses time to compete and says we want to compress the amount of time it takes to do everything we do. Not just make the product, but plan the product, plan new products, uh, take orders, ship, uh, collect cash, close the books, it doesn't matter. Okay? We want to reduce the amount of time it takes to do everything we do. As we do that, reduce time, we free up resources. And we have the ability now as we go forward, okay, to use time as a differentiator from our competitors. And as I like to say, time is really the currency of lean. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of companies that use time. Um, one of the examples I use is uh, Federal Express. You know, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. My daughter lives in Denver. I can send her a birthday card with a 45-cent stamp on it. And I'm pretty sure it'll get there in three days. On the other hand, I can go to Federal Express and pay them $15 to get it there tomorrow. Now, that's a huge premium between $0.45 cents and $15. Why would I spend that money? It's because something or somebody has convinced me that that 48-hour time advantage has value, and I'm willing to pay for that value. Okay? Um, so that's the way we, we need to think about time. Okay, so basically when we talk about traditional thinking in terms of implementing lean strategy, and this is the way Wiremold did it way back when, okay, this, we did this, we found it, we were founded in 1900, so we practiced this for a long time. Basically strategy, the, the, the creation of strategy and the execution of strategy were two separate things. Uh, executives would manage the company by the numbers. Uh, the, the the processes were basically imposed upon the people doing the work. Uh, we would bring in consultants and they would bring in best, so-called best practices and, and, and we, we would be happy supposedly with that. Um, we would have lots of silos, lots of fiefdoms, and lots of rules-based bureaucracy. I think we've all run into that in our, in our companies. And, and so, and basically a lot of projects going on. When we were going down our lean path and we started doing Hoshin planning, we, we found out we had 29 number one priorities. Um, and, and that was a wake-up call to us in terms of why nothing was getting done. You can't have 29 number one priorities. And, and so, uh, but we didn't, you know, we didn't really understand that at the time. Um, and then all the decision making is top down. Uh, that's the way we operated traditionally and the way most companies operate traditionally. Uh, 
so when, when we talk about the top-down decision making, we talk we talk basically about a something that looks like this. Okay, the executives of the company define what the strategy will be, the strategy they want to follow. They decide how to implement that strategy. They then drive that decision down through the organization and delegate its implementation uh, to the various fiefdoms. And very honestly, because the original strategic decision was generally made on incomplete or erroneous information about the company's capabilities, uh, everyone now has to deal with the fallout from a faulty implementation uh, because things are different than you know, than executives thought they were sitting in a conference room. Um, this is what we call in the book a people-free strategy. It basically looks at people as, a, quote, labor, and, uh, and they only need to do what they're told. This is the traditional strategic implementation thinking. On the other hand, when we start talking about, in the lean world, how we, dis how we change the way we thought about this, Okay, it, it became something very different. Whereas instead of have what we call the four Ds of define, decide, drive, and deal, we, we, we in the book we discuss the four Fs. Okay, and and the first thing we need we need to do is basically formulate a learning plan. We have to understand that we don't know what we need to do yet because we don't really know what our capabilities are. We need to commit to a learning curve rather than an action plan. Um, we need to figure out what do we need for daily problem solving? Where should we uh, aim our Kaizen efforts? Um, what experiments should we be doing to find out what the root cause of our problems are and what the countermeasures might be? Uh, this, this is all part of a different way of thinking up front saying, it, it starts from a point that says, I don't know, and I need to learn, okay? And so we need to organize for learning. We need to understand that instead of, uh, instead of the best practices uh, uh, approach that says we're just going to impose it on people, we need to understand that the people doing the work are the ones that really understand where the problems are. So we need our systems and processes really to be people-centric and involve them in what we're doing. Uh, our line managers are, uh, and all middle management uh, need to, or actually all management, but need to be aware of the fact that their job is changing. They're changing from, quote, being the boss to really being someone who will work with the people that they have reporting to them to build those, their capabilities. And they build it by practicing uh, continuous improvement and learning by doing. You don't learn lean by sitting in a classroom. You don't learn lean by reading a textbook. Certainly books can, can pique your curiosity and help you uh, point in the right direction as to where you want to learn. But you really learn lean by doing lean. Okay? And then, and then they, they have to realize that their job has also changed from a role of telling people what to do to asking questions. And that's very honestly for a lot of people in middle management a very, and top management, a very difficult transition to make. Um, as I said, we're not talking here about optimizing something. We're talking about learning and improving things on a continuous basis. We're not looking to say, you know, what's the best practice? We'll put it in place and it'll be there forever. Uh, that's not the way our thinking is. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the basic principles of the Toyota uh, house is respect for people. And when you look at how Toyota defines that, they really, they really talk about challenging people uh, to be the best that they can be and giving them the support to get there. Uh, when you do that, you are really respecting people because you're saying, I think you're better than you think you are, and I'm going to give you a challenge so that you can prove to yourself that you are better. And you, I, I can tell you from personal experience, we did, we had wire mold, we did 21 acquisitions, and I can tell you it works. 
when you challenge people like that, I mean, the, 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 once they start understanding what they're capable of doing in terms of solving problems, I mean, the light goes on and they just are different people. Um, okay, so, so we, had, we have to basically form that learning program. Now we want to find the right problems to solve, okay? And we don't find those problems by sitting in a conference room. Okay, we find those problems by going to where the work is being done to the Gimbra. Um, and and what, we are, what our role as leaders is, is to support, to ask questions about what are your problems today that are keeping you from doing your job, and then support the people in, in developing immediate solutions to those problems. Um, and by doing that, we were, hopefully we're showing a commitment to personal learning as leaders and organizational learning. Um, and, and as we do that, we now begin to see the real underlying problems and not just the symptoms. Um, and, we, and, and once we un start identifying those, we can now look at what capabilities are we lacking that we need to develop to solve those problems. And, and this, is, this is the role of leadership, is to, is to identify the, with what these capabilities need to be and to provide the, the resources uh, that are needed to, uh, to develop these capabilities. So we find the problems and now we have to face the reality that these problems are a lot different than what we thought they were. Uh, sitting in our office, we've, you know, one of the things about communication up and down a, an organization is that as information travels up the organization from the lowest levels where the work is being done to up to the executive suite, um, uh, things get filtered out. And what gets filtered out is the bad stuff. And so sitting in my office uh, as a CFO, uh, if I sit, just sit there and listen to what I'm being told, everything is rosy. Um, things are great, okay? Uh, but the reality is by going out to the Gemba, we find out that's not true. So we face that reality now by developing non-financial operational process metrics that will help give us a clear picture of the current situation, that will help us uh, clearly see improvement as it takes place, and we need to basically uh, convert from standard uh, management accounting practices, traditional management accounting practices, to lean management accounting. Because traditional management accounting hides, hides problems and it hides progress. Um, so once we face that reality, now as leaders, what we need to do is frame the challenges we have in terms that people can understand very clear, simple language that indicate improvement directions. Uh, I think you've probably all heard this, this phrase about true north, okay? Well, all of our improvement directions need to point to true north, okay? And we need to describe these, these challenges in a way that people understand them so that when we set these improvement directions, we do it so that we, we describe in a way that everybody can see how they can personally contribute to moving forward, okay? And, you know, as we move forward, one of the things we're trying to do is create productivity improvement, okay? And when we create productivity improvement, because productivity is a physical, non-financial concept, okay, we can only have a productivity improvement when we have physical change. Okay, no amount of financial engineering will ever create one iota of a productivity improvement. Okay, it's a physical concept and you need to physically change things uh, to improve productivity. As I mentioned before, with this time-based strategy, when we improve productivity, we free up resources to grow without having to add new resources because we already have the people, we already have the machines, and we've got free capacity now, okay? So this frees up resources so that the next unit we sell 
really the only added cost of that next unit is its material content. Okay, because we have the people, we have the machines. Okay, so everything beyond material content falls to the bottom line in terms of additional profit. We also need to be when we when we frame uh, this these uh, this business case. Uh, we need to get people to understand that lean is a growth strategy because we've freed up all this capacity. We don't want people just standing around staring at each other. We want to utilize that capacity, and the best way to do that is through growth. And by improving quality and increasing innovation in our products, we will, and, and, and using time as, as a way of doing things that our competitors can't do, uh, we will grow sales. We will we will grow the market. We will, uh, in some cases, even take market share. Uh, the other thing about this business case we need to get people to understand is that as we create flow, we will free up lots and lots of cash uh, because flow eliminates the need for a lot of inventory. And as we free that free up that cash, that cash can be used to finance our growth. Um, the other thing uh, about this business case that we need to describe is how Kaizen will lower our cost over time. Uh, not in the sense that it's a cost reduction program, but it's a byproduct of all these things we do. We will end up with lower cost. And, um, and as I said, when we free up this capacity, uh, we can basically start introducing a rapid stream of new products. At Wiremold, as I said earlier, we went from a product development process that took years to a development process that took months. So that instead of two to three new products every year, we had two to three products every quarter, and then eventually two to three products, new products every month. And, uh, and we were able to uh, absorb the volume, the additional volume that those new products created with this freed up capacity. I mean, if you look at our biggest plant in West Hartford, we doubled the volume of that plant over two years with the same number of people. Okay. Um, so, so if you go back and look at that original slide that I had that showed those metrics of wire mold, we added 13 percentage points of gross profit. Okay. That wasn't done by laying people off and things like that. That was done by using our freed up capacity to grow. And now, basically what you do is that capacity becomes a fixed cost, be it the people, the machines, okay? And as a fixed cost, as you grow your revenue line, those costs go down as a percentage of sales. They stay constant in terms of dollar amount, but they go down as a percentage of sales. And, and, and you end up with more gross profit, more net profit. Uh, those, that's the economics of lean. So why doesn't everybody do it, if it's that good? The concepts really are pretty simple. The reality is, it's not easy. You know, Thelonious Monk, the, the great jazz musician, uh, once said, you know, simple ain't easy. Uh, somebody was asking him about this, this wonderfully beautiful, simple melody that he was playing. And, and, and he said, yeah, it is beautiful, but simple ain't easy. Uh, so why is it so hard? Uh, and, and why do so many companies that embark on a lean journey fail? Um, I personally think that the biggest reason, there are, there are a number of reasons, but I think the biggest reason is because CEOs and executives don't look at lean as a strategy. They don't understand lean as a strategy. They look at lean as some manufacturing thing, uh, as some cost reduction project, pro project. They delegate it it's some element of a larger strategy. They delegate it down the organization, but they don't remove any of the barriers. They still have a make the month mentality, which I think we've all seen uh, in our companies. They use canned computer solutions that they impose on the organization, regardless of whether it's a good fit or not. They continue to use in a manufacturing world standard cost accounting, and they use uh, performance metrics that are either inappropriate or even harmful. Uh, and, and all these represent barriers 
um, so so that the organization, as it tries to move forward, will start hitting resistance because of these barriers, and ultimately will fail in its in its efforts. Um, the, the reality is, unless the CEO makes lean a strategy, the chances of success are, in my mind, slim to none. Um, I mean, the, the reality, you know, when we talk about implementing a lean strategy, we're talking about making a transformation in our thinking, thinking, of, thinking about the organization differently. Okay, um, if you go back and look at the book Lean Thinking that was published in 1995 and 1996, it's really about thinking differently and about companies that did that. Okay, and what we're trying to do is change the culture of our company. And that requires leadership because, you know, in the end, companies are just a collection of people. That's all they are. They're a collection of people that come to work every day and try to satisfy a group, group of customers better than the competition. And it's people that are going to make us successful or not. Okay. And so we have to think about this very, very differently and think about people very differently. When we when we talk in the in, in the book the lean strategy we talk about a people centric culture, not a people free culture, and we go into a lot of description of what we mean by that. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a wrap up. Uh, it's really a, a very brief overview of some of the central messages, uh, and uh, again, it's hard to you know. 35, 40 minutes to describe uh, a, a book, but um, hopefully that will give you a taste of, of what, uh, of how we think about a lean strategy. If you go to the link that Dwayne is going to provide to you, um, to the LEI website uh, and the lean post, which is a lean blog, um, the the article that I wrote is entitled, Yes, Lean is a Strategy, and it was in response to a previous article that was posted as kind of like a debate, if you will, between Art Byrne, who was Wiremold's CEO uh, at the time we, we did this, and, uh, and Dan Markowitz, and they kind of debated whether Lean was a strategy, and with Dan taking the side that, no, it's not. And, and so that prompted me to write my article saying, yes, lean is a strategy. And as of this morning, it's, it's ended over 50 uh, comments. Um, and some of them uh, basically very, very adamant about lean not being a strategy and others uh, uh, agreeing that it is. So it would be an interesting, uh, it's an interesting discussion and I think you might enjoy reading it. Uh, to help formulate your own opinions about this. Um, but um, so I thank you for your time. Thank you for participating. Um, and Joanne, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, Ori, uh, th thanks so much for uh, really a couple things. One, your leadership uh, in the lean community over the years, but on a, on a personal level, thanks for your support of Lean Frontiers and the Lean Accounting Summit over the years, and as Ori was going through this, I'm just reminded of uh, why uh, this event, this Lean Accounting and Management Summit, is an important one. And you know, I, I understand this might come off as a sales pitch, but uh, Ori, these are the kind of presentations we've heard for years at the Lean Accounting Summit, and uh, how it's not. <laughs> like you said earlier, why isn't everyone doing this? <laughs> uh, you know, so, go yeah, ahead. Dwayne, you know, just, it's, it's a really good question, and it's one that those of us uh, that have been dealing with this struggle with for, for a long time. There are multiple reasons. Part of it is very honestly in the academic community. Uh, they are, for the most part, there are some, a few notable exceptions, but for the most part, they are still teaching strategy the way it's been taught for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. and they've been very resistant to, to change that. Uh, and if you read, by the way, and if you read that lean post, uh, you'll see that in some of the comments. 
Uh, so if people are going through and getting MBAs and MSs in management and stuff like that, and they're still being taught about strategy in what I consider an obsolete way, uh, you know, when they get to work, they're going to think the way they were taught. Uh, to me, that's a big barrier, and I don't, you know, the, the academic community really has to get on board. Yeah, I, I would say a couple of things related to that then, Ori. If there are any academics uh, watching this right now, either live or uh, the, the on-demand version, reach out to us uh, at, here at Lean Frontiers. We've got, there's, there's a small little network of what we call them rogue professors who get these things that Ori is saying. Um, and they are trying to incorporate that in their classroom. So we're happy to connect you, uh, if you're an academic, with those other academics doing this type of work. I would also add to that, that if you're a company and you've got a university near you, invite, uh, invite the accounting professors, invite the, the manage, business management professors in, and uh, maybe expose them to this way of thinking. Uh, you know that it's very small ways, but uh, if if all of us kind of take a crack at this, maybe we can make some movement. I know, or you know this is about as well as anyone, but we've long had at the Lean Accounting Summit a uh, contingent of uh, academics who are engaged there. We've even offered scholarships to professors and students, and LEI is uh, provides an award. Uh, that we offer to uh, professors and students make, doing good things along these lines. So there is yeah. some some work being done, but just just not enough. So yeah, if I, in fact, Dwayne, I've got an accounting professor from my old alma mater coming to the Lane Accounting Summit this year under one of your scholarships. Oh, that's great! Glad so. glad to hear that. That's certainly why why we've done it from the the very beginning. If we can influence the academic side of things, hopefully. Uh, that will yep. carry, carry forward. So uh, as, as I mentioned, please do join us at the Lean Accounting and Management Summit September 14th and 15th in Savannah, Georgia, where you're not only going to meet Ori, but uh, your, your cohort there, uh, who you mentioned earlier, Art Byrne, will also yes. be there. So yes, great will. opportunity. Yeah, great opportunity to meet both Ori and Art, uh, uh, kind of a famed duo there from uh, from Lean Thinking. Uh, you'll also uh, find an agenda at the, that summit that's full of thought leaders and practitioners who uh, really are doing what what Ori is describing here, This tr going from a traditional accounting practices, traditional management practices to, to this Lean strategy. So uh, if you're interested in attending, uh, we are offering a uh, a 10% discount if you register using the discount code webinar. That'll knock 10% off your registration fee. Um, but I do hope that we will see you in Savannah. If you've not been there before, it's a charming, historic, very scenic and walkable city. Um, some incredible dining. I'd be happy to share with you some of my personal dining experiences if you're looking for recommendations. So. Anyway, thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Ori, thank you, and we'll see everyone in Savannah. Thank you, Joanne. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.